Um, my name is Amanda Granger. I'm a producer at WNET, um, New York Public Media. We operate Channel 13 in New York City, um, which is a PBS station there, WLIW in Long Island, and NJTV in New Jersey. Um, I work in the education department, um, and we do a, um, we create tons and tons of resources um, connected to the national PBS programming that WNET produces. Um, but sometimes we also get to do uh, projects that are exclusively uh, for educational audience, such as Mission US, um, which is a very exciting way to teach your students about US history. So that's what we'll be talking about today. And again, um, thank you all for coming. So unfortunately, it seems still today that our students do not know very much about US history, uh, despite our best efforts. Um, so on the NAEP in 2014, 18% of eighth graders performed at or above the proficient level in American history. And when we started this project um, more than five years ago, the same, <laughs> it was a similar situation. Um, and so the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and the National Endowment for Humanities um, kind of put out a call to see about ways that we could engage students in learning American history. And WNET came up with the idea of doing a set of interactive games um, called Mission US. And the proposal was funded, thankfully. Um, it originally was funded for five, um, but I have some good news for you at the end of the presentation. Um, so just a quick call, how familiar are you with Mission US? A, I've used several of the missions with my students. Okay. Um, B, I've used one of the missions with my students. C, I am familiar with Mission US, but have not used it with my students. All right, and what is Mission US? <laughs> Great! <laughs> Great, fantastic. This is perfect. <laughs> and um, next, how often do you use digital games in your classroom? So rarely, never. All right, I appreciate your honesty. Uh, occasionally, one to two times a month. Frequently, three to four times a month and always, every day. OK, good. So we've got a good mix of people. That's great. And the beautiful thing about Mission US is it really is designed so that different teachers um, you know, at kind of different stages in their engagement with uh, digital games can, can use this. All right, so traditionally, um, again, when we started this project, if you said social studies, computer game, um, the first thing that people thought of was, Oregon Trail, <laughs> uh, which is a personal favorite of mine. I played Oregon Trail when I was in school. Um, but generally, it was a reward at the end of the unit. You know, you did your unit on Westward Expansion, and you got a day in the computer lab as a treat to play Oregon Trail, and that was that. Um, and we really wanted to move away from this model into um, the, the game-based learning model proposed by James Paul Gee. So, we want students to be empowered. Um, we want them to use real problem-solving skills. Um, and we wanted to really create a game that's going to help students understand, um, use systems thinking, um, and get situated meaning um, from what they were looking at. Um, and the other thing that we, we took into consideration is we know that students are already playing video games, um, many of them with budgets many, 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 many times larger than we had to operate with. But we took some of, um, of the functionality and some of the tools um, from commercial video games and translated them into our game so that students would already know how um, to use the game because they'd already been familiar um, with those other games before. Um, so let's just dive in. Here's Mission US. Currently, we have four missions available, and uh, you can access all four missions at mission-us.org. Also, if you are on PBS Learning Media, they're available through um, PBS Learning Media uh, as well. You will notice that nowhere on um, the website does it say PBS um, or public television, and that's because we recognize that for middle school students, um, PBS is something that kids watch and <laughs> that adults watch. And it's not necessarily something that connects with them as a brand. And so we were really careful to make this its own thing and to not um, connect it with some of that younger PBS kids programming that they might be familiar with. 
So our objective source was to just make students care about history, to make them feel connected um, to history, to move that needle on the, on the NAEP, um, and to address key historical content and historical thinking skills. Um, and again, like I said before, this is really designed to provide um, easy and flexible implementation for teachers, whatever level they are um, with, with online games. So I'm just going to go briefly through all four of the missions, um, and apologies to those of you who have already <laughs> played several in your class, but I just do want to give you an idea of what's there um, for you to use. The first mission, and this is by far our most popular mission, um, you can probably guess why, is for Crown or Colony, and this is about a boy um, in 1770, we call them peers from the past, he's 12 years old, um, or sorry, he's 14 years old, and um, and he is in Boston um, around the time of the American Revolution. And so he gets a unique perspective on that. Um, the, the questions that students are able to answer through playing this game are, why would people who enjoy the benefit of being a part of the most powerful empire in the world risk their lives to revolt? How do big changes, like a revolution against the government, happen? Is violence ever justified? And do the colonists practice what they preach? And the core historical concept in this one is multiple perspectives. There's a really um, cool scene in the game where each, uh, where you watch the Boston Massacre, and what you, ends up happening is everyone plays the game, everyone watches the Boston Massacre, but unbeknownst to your students, they all actually see different things. And then they see the newspaper article that comes out the next day, and they see that famous um, painting of what happened, and it's completely different from what anyone in the class saw. Not completely different, but it's different from what anyone in the class saw. And then you can have a conversation. What did you see versus what did you see versus what was in the newspaper? And so they really understand that you know what's in the media might not necessarily connect one-to-one -one, um, with what they've seen and what other people have seen. So it's, it's a really cool um, game. And I think that scene especially really does a great job with the multiple perspectives. The next um, I'd like to Freedom. Again, you are 14 years old on a plantation in Kentucky. This is actually a real plantation that existed, and all of the graphics are based on historical photographs of this plantation. Um, and you are traveling on the Underground Railroad. And what's great about this, but what is historically accurate about this, is it's actually very, very difficult for you to escape. Students, um, more often than not, will not end up escaping. They'll be um, found and or sold back into slavery and so it really teaches students that you know what the Underground Railroad is actually much much more difficult than maybe they think that it was um, in their mind and that most slaves unfortunately were not successful in escaping. Um, so the questions here are why would an enslaved person risk running away? What could people slaves, abolitionist politicians do to try and end slavery. Um, and again, we want students to understand that escaping was difficult. We do also want them to understand um, that enslaved people were, um, were empowered, did have agency over um, their lives. Uh, what causes a shift in people's opinions? Is it events, arguments, persuasion, propaganda, or a combination of many factors? And is running away a challenge to the system of slavery or just a way to escape it? And the core historical concept here is cause and effect. Um, and we've had students get really, really into the game and really passionate about it. And they will play over and over and over and over and over again to actually see um, Lucy become successful. Oh, and also during this, um, at some point during the game, the Fugitive Slave Act is passed. And so it does teach students about um, about that and the, the effects that it had even on um, people who had found freedom in the North and found themselves, again, in a very precarious um, situation. Our third mission is a Cheyenne audience. And actually, the Northern Cheyenne tribe worked very, very closely with WNET on this mission and all of the voices um, of the um, Cheyenne uh, in the game are voiced by actual members of the Northern Cheyenne tribe, um, which unfortunately is very, <laughs> is rare um, in, in a lot of depictions of American Indians. And 
And so uh, it is really unique because it gives a different perspective on um, on something that we are, you know, we have to teach as part of American history, but it gives it from the perspective of the Northern Cheyenne. And again, you can see how legislation that happens during that time changes their situation um, in the, or changes the decision making of the character. Um, so here our questions are, why did violent conflict break out between the Plains Indians and European Americans in the second half of the 19th century? How does an individual decide what contributions to make and what role to play within his or her community? How are these choices shaped by cultural and ethnic values? And how can a culture sustain itself and adapt during times of dramatic change? And the core historical concept here is change and continuity over time. It was very, very, very important to um, the Northern Cheyenne that we work with that we not tell the story of westward expansion from the position of the um, or perspective and then have it stop there. Um, because unfortunately, many students come to believe that American Indians don't exist anymore. You know, like that. That that's a huge issue, um, and they really want to make it clear that that American Indians are still part of American culture um, and and everything that has happened um, historically since then. So in the last chapter, you go through um, a speed the main character's family and how they're. Um, and how his descendants um, have kind of carried on his traditions throughout time to the present day. So it talks about the American Indian movement in the 1970s and things like that. So it, that's the, the big theme for this mission. And then our latest mission is um, called City of Immigrants. And again, you are a 14-year-old um, Jewish immigrant from Russia who moves to the United States on the Lower East. Um, and ends up working in the Triangle Factory, um, and and we all know what happens there. <laughs> and if you don't, I don't want to ruin the mission for you. Um, but yeah, so this one deals um, with labor politics, um, immigration, um, and and that's pretty much it. <laughs> Those are the two big themes here. Uh, so what was the experience of young, young immigrants coming to New York in the early 20th century? How did immigrants adapt to life in the United States and what aspects of American culture attracted young immigrants? What were the working conditions for immigrant workers and how did they try to improve them? What was the importance of the progressive reform movement? And how was women's role in society changing during this period? And um, the historical thinking that we ask um, students is to in history. Um, so as you play the game, and I'm hoping to have a little bit of time um, at the end so that we can actually go through City of Immigrants, the beginning of it, so you can actually see how the gameplay goes. Uh, but it's very, it's heavy on dialogue, so there's a lot of reading involved, um, which I think is a good thing for students. Um, they are using maps, and actually, um, the, the longer that we do this, the more elaborate um, the the games get and the better the graphics get because the better the technology gets which is really exciting for us um, so this map is actually based on historical map of New York City so um, the the better the technology gets the more we're able to incorporate um, actual historical information and data uh, this one has a mini game you actually are in a um, sweatshop and you're trying to, it's very, very difficult. I actually have trouble with this one. Um, but you're essentially trying to sew in a straight line, and they kind of evaluate you based on how well you're able to sew. Um, this, this person at the time was not doing very well, as you can see, the little poor to good meter here. And the blue line tells you how well um, you're doing. So this is, this is relatively new. We don't have these in the earlier ones. Um, and now we're going to talk just a little bit about students and how they would use a role play. So again, just to pull you, raise your hand if you would be most likely to use a game in your classroom at the beginning of a unit. Middle of a unit. End of a unit for enrichment. End of a unit for assessment. Don't know. <laughs> OK. <laughs> And just out of curiosity, which statement best describes the technology available to students in your classroom? A, your one-to-one. -one. 
Okay. Uh, one tablet to one student, B. C, one computer shared among several students. Um, D, I can schedule time in a computer lab. All right. And E, my school has no technology. All right, good. No E's. <laughs> we can work with that. We can work with uh, we can work with all of the above. Um, so in entertainment games, a lot of times students will play straight through, like in Mario. Uh, for Mission US, they play a little, they do an activity. They play a little, they do an activity. They play a little, they do an activity. It's really designed um, so that they're not sitting and playing it all the way through. We have many, many, many activities available. Um, for teachers and students to use to break that up and to really make sure that they are learning from the game and understanding what's going on. Um, so on the website, which again, we'll, I hope to leave a little time to explore, um, there's an educator page and it has a guide for each one of the missions and then it also has a fair number of classroom videos so that you can actually see the game being implemented inside of classrooms. And these are incredibly robust. There are hundreds of pages of documents in here. You don't have to read all of them. <laughs> they are very well organized. Um, and you can pick and choose. Everything that's on, in the educator guide is available both as a PDF as an, and as a Word document. So feel free to adapt and change however, um, however you want. Um, so for example, in the Mission 4 guide, you're going to have a classroom guide, but you can also pull out individual parts like the essential questions or the learning goals, the national standards alignment. Um, mission three and four are aligned to the common core. Unfortunately, missions one and two came too soon, and they're not common core aligned. That doesn't mean that they're not usable within the first. Um, they, they operate in very similar ways as mission three and four. We just didn't have an opportunity to align them. And we don't have funding to align them now. So, um, but you can align them. And if you do align them, please let us know because we'd love to have that information to share with other educators. Um, and then in the activities, as you can see, we've got writing prompts, we've got DBQs, we've got vocabulary activities, review questions, answer keys. I mean, like I said, there's very, very robust educational resources for each one of these missions. Um, so, for example, here's one of the writing prompts. Um, you, uh, when Lena's family makes the choice to send her to New York City in place of her brother, her life drastically changes. Do you think Lena wanted to leave her friends and family in Minsk? How do you think she felt about traveling alone to a foreign country? Describe a time and place you had a new experience, for example, moving to a new school or traveling to a new Did you prepare yourself for the new experience? And, um, and we also have a lot of primary source documents available as well. Some of them are organized um, within the document-based activities. And then we do have a list in the resources section of just primary source documents that you can access and, and do whatever you want with. Yes. Um, they, everything, yeah, is spoken out loud. Yeah, yeah, it's, sorry, it's, they're not, they're not reading the game silently, I should have been clear about that. It, it's audio, but it's nice, they have the text there, so they do get a lot of replaying the game. All right, so when you're thinking about um, incorporating Mission US into your classroom, um, the first thing is to think about how much time you want to spend. We've organized this so you can do anything from one class period of 45 minutes to you know spreading it out over the course of an entire unit. Um, so play the game, review the curricular materials. I will tell you a secret. You don't have to play the whole game for you to do that, but we pride ourselves on making overviews that are so detailed that if for some reason you didn't play the game the whole way through, there's enough information in the curricular materials um, that you will know what's going to happen in the game and you can help guide students through it. Um, consider the dominant themes of your social studies instruction and then make a rough estimate of how much classroom time you'll dedicate. Um, some of these missions may be more aligned to what you're teaching than others. Um, so for some missions, again, you may want to spend one day on it. For other missions, you may want to spend a week on it or two weeks on it. 
Location, location, location. You have a lot of different options here. Students can play the game at home. Um, if you have your students register with their own username and password, their games will be saved. So if you do have students that do have access um, to computers at home or are able to stay after school in the computer lab and play as homework, that is one possibility. Um, and also in class, you can do one student and one computer, but you can, um, you can play with small groups. And also, if need be, and you only have the one computer set up, you can play as a whole group. Um, and again, you play for five minutes, just like you were showing a brain pop video, and then you stop and you do the next, you do an activity and hold discussions, and then you can come back and play a little bit more all together. So there are many different ways to structure the game play. Uh, uh, if characters, discussion, writing prompts, um, we have vocabulary activities to build literacy skills, although I think everything in Machine US is going to build their literacy skills. Um, and again, we have tons and tons of primary source documents for each one of these missions. Have students work with those primary sources and analyze those. After you do a high part, students will process what they're doing to integration, discussion, writing, and other activities. And again, you can do this eight to more than 10 class periods if you really um, go beginning, middle, and end um, on each part of the game. And I do want to say, too, that these levels of integration, they're in the Educator Resources Guide. Um, not over, and that have very detailed information of what a high level of integration looks like. I'm just doing um, an overview right now, but there is much more detailed information. Integration: um, students would split gameplay um, or lab as homework, and then you would still complement class and homework activities. Which they write about on and gameplay. The five class periods. And in the low integration situation, you would assign the game as homework, you give them, you know, several days or a week. Then you, you know, this is a flip situation where when they come back to class and everyone's played the game, you might do one or two activities, activities in, um, so that they can connect it to other things that they're learning about. Now here's the real question. Do games help students learn? Uh, well, we believe yes. So each Mission US game is designed to address common historical misconceptions or misunderstandings to support learning goals and to align with content and literacy standards. And in the early games, we did um, have extensive research. And it works. Um, we have over a million users from 50 states. We've done multiple external evaluations. Um, with over 1,200 middle school students, and the control group was taught the same topic, um, but without Mission US. And we see increased content knowledge. Um, the, sorry, the Mission US group, as you can see, 10%, um, 18%, 10% um, growth from the pretest to the post-test. And we see students have better historical thinking. Students who played Mission US um, were better able to show historical empathy and a deeper understanding of multiple perspectives. This is the one that I love. They were better able to put events in chronological thinking and show causal thinking. I know if you're a social studies teacher, this was always something that I taught social studies. And I really struggled with teaching sequencing to students. And it seemed like the easiest thing to do. You know, this happens first, this happens second, this happens third. And my students really, really struggled. They really struggled um, with cause and effect. And we found that the kids that play the game, they have no trouble sequencing these historical events whatsoever because like, well, yeah, I mean, first I came to America, and then this law was passed, and then this changed because I had to live. They, they, they were able to think about it because they put themselves in the position of that peer from the past and it makes it much, much easier to understand those cause and effects and those sequencing um, questions. Um, they were better at analyzing primary um, source documents for author's purpose. 
Um, they were better at writing explanation of different viewpoints, and they engaged in more complex classroom discussion about past events, problems, and perspectives. Um, so again, all of the external evaluations that we had said that this really, really does work for engaging students in historical thinking. Um, the other the teachers that use Mission US, 100% said they plan to use it again. 95% of their students displayed better knowledge of period appropriate vocabulary. 90% reported students to more than in typical social studies activities and discussions. And um, when the teachers said Mission US, just ask more of students. Um, so coming in January 2016, we are doing um, and that's conditioned in the past. So in Mission 5, they are twins, a boy and a girl, <laughs> who are living through the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl. Um, and that will be coming in January 2016. And um, we also, several weeks ago, got really great news that we're funded to do um, a, a mini mission on um, Japanese internment during World War II. And then we're going to be doing a full um, Mission 6 on the Civil Rights Movement. Um, so we're really, really excited about that. And, you know, we, we'd hope to keep going with them because, again, um, we feel really good about them. And, and a lot of teachers have been able to use them very successfully in their classroom. And as you can see, even this, <laughs> they look very, um, if you remember Crown and Colony, if you see Crown and Colony, the graphics just keep getting better and better and better and better. And so we're, we're very excited about um, this next one and the ones um, to follow. So what you can do is help to spread the word. Um, follow us on Facebook. You know, we, we got the character names for Mission 4 from suggestions from teachers on Facebook. So we, we really like to engage in teachers and know how you're using them um, to ask you for suggestions. We share previews of um, character designs and, and settings and stuff like that. Um, Twitter is mission underscore US. And do email us at missionus at 13.org if you are having any issues with the website or you have any questions. Um, we will get back to you and we will get those issues resolved. Um, and it's really helpful for us to stay engaged. So if you're having any issues at all, missionus at 13.org. Um, and I'm not done, but I do want to thank uh, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, the National Endowment for the Humanities, for funding Mission US. And um, I guess what I'd like to do right now is take a f any questions. And then I wanted to just do a whole group um, I'll just play Mission 4 for a little bit so everyone can see how this works. Does that sound all right? All right. Um, questions? Yes. Yes! I'm so sorry! It is absolutely free. It will always be free. It is 100% free. <laughs> yes. Do you have We do not, unfortunately. Um, we do not. These, uh, as you can imagine, they're very, very big projects. You know, for the kind of budgets that we work with, they're very expensive. Um, we got funded to do middle school because it was felt that there was a special need for middle school. Um, a lot of students take U.S. history in eighth grade. Um, we'd love to do more games. Yeah. Um, and, but I think too, you know, because it, it, I mean, it's really designed for sixth through eighth grade. If you have a fifth grade class that teaches U.S. history, um, I'm sure you can, again, because everything's in Word. So if you want to take the time and adapt it for a younger grade level, I think this would be entirely appropriate for, for most fifth graders. Any other questions? All right, let's get playing. Um, so every game has a prologue, five parts, and an epilogue. It's designed to be about 90 minutes long if you were to play it the entire way through. Again, we don't recommend that you do that. So you can take one part, play for 10 minutes, and then do an activity um, with your students.
Then my ship arrives in New York Harbor. They will ask me my name. I will say, Lena Brooks. When I am standing in line among the hundreds trying to enter America, they will ask, where are you from? And I will say, Minsk, in Russia. The officials will ask me many other things. Am I healthy? Have I a skill for a job? But they will not ask about why so many Jews flee to America. They will not ask why the Tsar pushed us off the bed or why moms attack our homes and shops. For my family, it was decided when my aunt and uncle were killed in a pogrom. My brother Isaac was the first to leave. He sends money back so the rest of our family can make the journey. Isaac says New York is full of great opportunities. It is bigger than Minsk, and there are many Jews, some so wealthy. Isaac sent a ticket for my brother, Jacob, but Jacob was forced into the Tsar's army, and from there we do not return. So instead, I am here. Mother and father will come next, if we can save the money. It took seven days to get from Minsk to Hamburg. It will be seven more to reach New York. Only two weeks to journey across the world. But if I do not pass this test, they will send me back. And I cannot go back. So I practice. My name is Lena Brodsky. I am from Minsk in Russia. As 14-year-old Lena, you will navigate the city of immigrants, discovering new people and places and facing obstacles along the way. There is no winning and losing, but the choices you make will affect both your present journey and future path. What will Lena achieve as a newcomer to America? Which turning points will determine her ultimate destiny? After seven days at sea, I was exhausted. The rocking of the ship made it hard to keep down what little food I ate, and the air in our crowded quarters was foul. I was on my way up to the deck for fresh air when a man shouted, We were close to land! Everyone rushed to the deck to see New York come into view, and many gasped when they saw the great woman of liberty. We kept sailing up the river and then turned to dock. All of the first class passengers got off the ship. They looked so fine in their fancy clothes. Finally, my foot touched America for the first time. We boarded ferries to Ellis Island, and my heart started beating faster and faster. I tried to concentrate on my answers as we got closer. We lined up in front of a big building. I did not speak English, but neither did Isaac, and he made it through. And then when you have options, they'll all um, pop up on the bottom of the screen. Click the pack button to view your possessions. Once inside. People with big bags had to leave them. Some were afraid that the guards would steal the treasured items they had brought from home. So if we look in a pack, we have $5.63. Um, we have a letter from uh, her brother to her. And a letter um, from Lena to her parents. And you can see, you can listen. Now, how do I get back? Um, so do we want to cover our bag? Um, do you want to join the line of people heading upstairs? Or do we want to ask whether you need to leave your bag? It is not as large as most. Give it a shout. Yeah. Ask? All right. The man does not speak Yiddish, but you point to your bag, and he shakes his head and directs you to the line upstairs. And anytime you see a yellow um, word, that's a smart word. 
and it'll pop up on a little flashcard. At the top of the stairs, I saw a man putting a chalk mark on a person's coat. Was the mark good or bad? Stay back and watch who he marks next. Ask someone what the marks mean. Try to blend in with a group as you go by. Walk forward with confidence. Stay back, okay. <laughs> you start blocking the line and someone elbows you. Keep watching, try and blend in with a group, or walk forward with confidence. All right. You walk to the inspector who looks you over for a few seconds. In Yiddish, name, age. Lena Brodsky, 14. I am Lena Brodsky and I'm 14 years old. I am Lena Brodsky and I'm 14 years old. I am from Minsk in Russia. <laughs> the one she's been practicing. He looks into your eyes, he fingers his chalk. Wait or smile. He pauses and then glances at the long line behind you. He waves you through. The next man. A doctor was even more frightening. He made us stand still while he examined the inside of our eyelids. Thank goodness that only lasted a few seconds. I was directed to a waiting area in the main hall and told to wear an inspection card that said which ship I had arrived on. Find a I found the spot and sat down for the first time in hours. I suddenly realized how hungry I was, but all I could do was wait. Ask the man next to you if he has anything to eat, look at pictures of your family, or wait. Eventually, the people in my section were told to form a line for the customs inspection. I practiced my answers until... Next. He waves you forward. Name, age, and nationality. My name is Lena Brodsky. I'm from Miss... Minsk in Russia, I am 14 years old. My name is Lena Brodsky, I am 14 years old, I am Jewish. Or my name is Lena Brodsky, I was born on November 25th, 1893. I grew up in Minsk, Russia. See those people waiting, Miss? I don't need their whole life story. She's sorry, or does she mother herself? What a nudnik. <laughs> what is your final destination? I'm going to live with my brother Isaac, America, or hand him the envelope in your pocket. You'll need to be more specific. What <laughs> relatives are you joining? Where do they live? My brother, I have his letter here. Show him the envelope. My brother and his wife, I don't know where they live. My brother and his wife, I haven't met her yet. Mama says she's a... <laughs> 47 Orchard Street, New York. All right, there's a room downstairs where you can wait for him. He knows you're arriving on this ship, right? Lie? Of course! He sent me the ticket for my passage. Uh, well, I think so. Or no, you see, my brother Jacob was supposed to come. Good. We don't let young women leave here without a proper escort. What if he forgets to come, or why not? Don't worry. They can telegraph him to come get you. We wouldn't let you loose on the streets by yourself. Of course, thank you. Or what do you mean? Let's see. How much money do you have? Lie, $50. I have $5. Is that enough? Lie, I don't have any money. None, okay. None at all? Are you sure? Uh, I forgot. I have $5. Yes, I'm sure. Or does it matter how much money I have? I forgot. That's good. People think we have enough problems here without having to worry about beggars. Which is why I must also ask, have you ever been in prison, an almshouse, or a home for the insane? Are you an anarchist? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to America, Miss. Go down that middle stairway to the detention. Next. I had made it. Feeling lighter, I headed down the steps to wait for Isaac. Maybe too light. Halfway down, I started to feel faint. A little nauseous. Was I sick? Would they send me back? Spots appeared in front of my eyes. 
The last thing I remember is trying to hold onto the rail so I wouldn't fall. When I opened my eyes, there was Isaac, looking buried and confused. Where was I? Lena, my God, how you have grown. But what are you doing here? I fainted. I think I was hungry. Are they sending me back? Jacob was drafted into the Tsar's army. Mama decided that I should come instead. That is terrible. Oh, I warned father that this would happen before I left. Now what? Now you take me home, I hope. <laughs> or I know, it was terrible. Father was inconsolable. Mother was silent and just worked harder. You're practical like mother. <laughs> Very well, I will be the same. I was counting on Jacob to work harder than my business. I can do things. I can earn my keep. I'm sorry, I'm not Jacob. Tell me what it is you can do. I'm quick with my hands and can easily learn to craft. I'm good with numbers and help with the shop at home. I can sing and put a smile on anyone's face. <laughs> Mama must have taught you that. Maybe you can help in my business. I'm too busy to do bookkeeping. What is your business? I think I'm feeling better. Can you take me home now? <laughs> yes. The doctors say you can go, but we must hurry. It's Friday. And Sonia will be worried if we are not back for Shabbat dinner. One last ferry ride, and my journey would be over. I was happy and homesick all at once. I couldn't stop asking Isaac questions, but he didn't want to talk. When we walked up Manhattan Island, I could hardly believe it. Crowds of newcomers disappeared from the wagons and into the street. Isaac hurried for me rumbling about missing the rest. I tried to keep up. There was so much to see. So many different people. The building that seemed to touch the sky. Isaac. Isaac? Excuse me. Can I help you? You look lost. I got separated from my brother. He was taking me home, but now I don't know where that is. Yes, can you tell me where Isaac Brodsky lives? No, I'm fine. <laughs> we got millions of people here, Ned. Isaac Brodsky. Sounds like a Russian show. That right? Yes, that's right, or I had better go. And from your accent, uh, I guess somewhere around Minsk. That right? Yes, that's right, or I had better go. If I were you, I go to the Minsk synagogue. They probably know it. It's too far for a lady such as yourself to walk. Let me get you a cat. Thank you. That is nice of you. I can get there myself. Thank you. <laughs> as you turn away, another young man approaches you. You're to turn your back on him. He's trouble. Listen, my name is Zeb. What's your name? I'm Lena. I'm Lena Brodsky. Please leave me alone. Of course, miss. I was just trying to help a pretty girl. If you'll excuse me and walk away, or I'm sorry, yes, I could use some help. <laughs> you are one step closer to earning the intrepid badge. So depending on the decisions that you make, um, you earn different badges um, in, uh, in the games. And there are different ones um, for different games, depending on the context. But clearly, Lena is being rewarded for her independence and her, <laughs> um, and her bravery. You are scared and tired, but determined to find Isaac's apartment on your own. You're not some country peasant, but a city girl. And then you click on the yellow dot to move Lena. And the historical photographs pop up. We are actually um, right at time, uh, or right about time, so I'm going to stop it here. But it's just to give you an idea of how the gameplay works. And again, um, clearly it's wonderful if each student can play one-to-one, -one, but you can play um, with whole groups. And then again, after you're finished with the first part, you can go back and do the classroom activities. Um, so thank you again for coming. Uh, enjoy the rest of your conference. And I'll, I'll be outside or around um, for anyone who has any questions.